Hi, Alfredo here. First of all, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. I really appreciate it. I am currently a doctoral student at the Laboratory of Evolutionary Protocology, advised by Professor Daniel Lara. We are at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Before anything, I'd like to share with you, if I'm sure of anything in this life, that thing is that the process shown in this picture, no matter when you are watching this video, is happening right now around the world. This picture shows a testate amoeba building a new shell shortly after cell division. So, to warm up, I'll let you enjoy for a moment this incredible video made by Professor Harald Nedzel in 1969. Amazing, isn't it? So, if you got interest to know or to refresh your memory about the shell structure and formation process in these organisms with a literature overview, stay tuned until the end of this video because that's what I'm going to be talking about by presenting the manuscript we published earlier this year in the journal Protistology. To do that, I'll first introduce the organisms we chose as our model, our cell genus, and explain that choice. Also, I'm going to tell you the motivation we had to prepare this manuscript. Then, I'm going to present the timeline of the literature that helps us understand the shell structure and formation process in our cell. Finally, I'm going to discuss some current gaps and future perspectives on the topic. So, let's talk about our model organism. Our selenida is characterized by the presence of an external rigid shell that covers the cell of these organisms. In our manuscript, we focus on the genus Arcella. Arcella is a highly diverse genus. It is present in diverse freshwater environments. We are able to cultivate many of them in laboratory cultures. And also, this genus have been well represented in the literature. Because of that, our cell genomes represent a great model for our selenida. Also, we believe that a comprehensive understanding of this genus can establish a background to facilitate studying the other representatives of our selenida. Our cell genus is well recognized by a shell circular in its aperture view and hemispherical in its side view, like the representatives I'm showing here. But also, uh, the arcella is represented by some, let's say, unusual shapes. For example, the croissant-like shape of arcella excavata, try not to get confused between them, or even the wizard head shape that arcella gandalf have. Now, I would like to share the motivation we had for this manuscript. Here, a spoiler of the literature timeline that I will discuss soon, but as you can already see, it is a vast literature spread over more than a hundred years of studies. So, we aim to compile the information in our manuscript and hopefully serve as an invitation to know this fantastic literature and base future studies. Let's take a look at this timeline. Up to date, we have over 25 studies in a period of more than 100 years that describe the structure of our cell shell and its formation process. To facilitate, we can look at this timeline as two different periods. The first one enabled by optical microscopy and the second one enabled by electron microscopy. I propose we start with the first period of this timeline. And obviously, the first study to highlight is the original description of Arcella by Ehrenberg in 1830. This study is a milestone not only because it's the first description of Narcelinid, but also because the use of microscope in the 1830s is considered one of the most relevant events in biology of that period, and Edinburgh is one of the influences for that. The following decades would see advances in optical microscopy that base the description of the shell structure in Arcelinida. For instance, in 1890, Tenar shows 
in his drawings, the structure of our cell had been composed by hexagonal units. These units had been observed before and have been corroborated by many authors. For instance, Cushman and Henderson in 1906 had described the shell of Arcella vulgaris as a network of hexagons that they beautifully show in this picture. These authors use the technique of oil immersion that we can see in this figure here that enable a better resolution of the structure of our cell shell. Of course, this first period of our timeline have many discoveries, but the one that interests us here is that the our cell shell is composed by hexagonal units. Some authors describe as a honeycomb-like structure, others as a network of hexagonals. Anyways, this structure makes much more sense when we gain insights of the shell formation process in our cell. So, let's focus now in the second period of our timeline to understand how the shell formation process happens. The first thing to know is that between 1928 and 1963, Little was discussed about our cell shell. In this period, the studies were focusing on the ecological aspects of these organisms. But in the meantime, the electron microscope was created, advanced, and became available for many researchers. And it was the electron microscope that enabled the discoveries of the second period of our timeline. In 1963, Kambar and colleagues published one of the first micrographs of our cell shell. In their pictures, it is clearly demonstrated the hexagonal units that composes our cell shell. In the following year already, Chahé and Vivier also used electron microscope to study our cell shell. Once more, the hexagonal units are demonstrated. But the cherry on the top of the cake of this study is the presentation of cytological sections of our cell cell. This kind of technique would be soon applied to finally describe how these organisms build their shell. Now I'm going to describe the shell formation process based on the studies that appeared in the following years, especially those of Nedzel, Grunewald, Minho, and Reichog. These studies were generated in the second period of our timeline and used electron microscope. The first evidence of shell formation is the growth of the cytoplasm as a bud through the shell aperture. So here in figure A we can see this, this process. So we have the shell, inside the shell we have the cytoplasm and the cytoplasm is growing as a bud through the aperture. Also in the same stage we can see the concentration of tecagenous granules inside the cytoplasm. These granules are the vesicles that contain the shell material that's going to compose the new shell. The bud continues to grow and while that, these vesicles become organized in a single layer inside the cytoplasm near the cell membrane. Once organized, these vesicles are secreted all at once and will give form to the new shell as we can see in figure C, uh, an amorphous shell. Note that in figure C we see uh, cytoplasmic protrusions that are the pseudopodial dome that covers the new forming shell and limits the growth of the cytoplasm that gives shape to the new shell. As we can see in figure D, it is the flux of the cytoplasm from the older shell towards the new shell that gives shape to the newly formed shell. And once the shape is already determined, we are able to see cytoplasmic flux between the old and the new shell and finally the process of cytokinesis that will give two separated individuals. As a whole, this process, since the 
cytoplasmic growth as a bud until the process of cytokinesis takes around 30 minutes in our cell. The cytological section I showed you and many others base our current understanding of the shell formation process in our cell and enable us to understand the video I showed you in the beginning of the presentation. But maybe you are wondering how the tachygenous granule become the hexagon units of our cell shell. Well, let's use this scheme to help us. The first thing we need to realize is that the tachygenous granule are spheres and once they are secreted, they are still not rigid and they are subject to the force of the cytoplasmic flux from one side and the resistance of the external environment in the other side and that makes the tachygenous ground flatten. However, since all the tachygenous ground are secreted all at once and they are really close to each other, they do not have the, all the space they need to expand to the side and each of the granules become a resistance to each other. The consequence of that is that instead of flatten and become circular, they flatten and become hexagonal. As we can clearly see in this figure here, where we show the section of our cell shell, and we can observe the units that form the shell as flattened hexagon. Well, as Uncle Ben told Spider-Man, Great science comes with great questions, or something like that. Well, here's not different. The many generations of researchers interested in the shell structure and formation process in our cell discovered many things, while also raised several questions, and I'd like to mention some of them here. The first question is about shell regeneration. This topic was considered by the two most recent studies that discuss the shell formation process in our cell, and they are Pichelli in 2010 and Volkova and Smirnov 2016. These studies demonstrate that our cell is able to regenerate its shell and also to recover its shell morphology. The possibility of our cell managing to survive without a shell or even to regenerate it was proposed long ago. For example, in 1906 by Averincio and later by Hegner and Cavallini. However, this topic remained undescribed until Pichelli and Volkova and Smirnov studies. The second issue I'd like to raise here is about the diversity of morphologies our cell, genus and other taste data maybe have. As the example I showed before, what and how is different in the shell formation process of our cell excavata that have a shape resembling a cross and bread, or even our cell Gandalfi that has a shell that resembles a wizard hat? Or what is different between the shell formation process in species that have smooth shell from those species that have shells with slight folds? Or even more intriguing, the same species that in one environment have a smooth shell while in another environment have a shell with folds. So, what is the relation between the shell formation process and the diversity of morphologies we know in this organism? Finally, I'd like to discuss the question that most interests me greatly, that is, what is the molecular apparatus underlying the shell formation process? This question is the central topic of my doctoral study that our laboratory and a collaborating laboratory is currently working on. Of course, this question was raised long ago by some authors. For example, in 1977, Ned and Grunewald explicitly stated that the relation between genes and the morphogenesis of shell was far from clear at that time, and actually remains unclear until now. Even earlier, in 1953, the Flandre discussed that when we are looking at an organism's shell, we are actually observing the cellular morphogenetic faculties of that organism externalized. As I mentioned, understand what is the molecular apparatus involved in shell formation is the central focus of my doctoral study. 
and by understanding that we aim to shed light in the origin and evolution of the shell in these organisms. The message I want to pass is that currently we are in a period of the literature with little mention of the shell structure and formation process in our cell and other testate amoebae, just like what happened between the first and the second period of our timeline, when the electron microscope appeared, was created and revolutionized our understanding of the shell structure and formation process in our cell. Well, right now we are in the era of omics, of next generation sequencing, of fourth generation sequencing, just to cite some. So, we are right now in the high time to develop further our current understanding of the shell formation process in our cell and other taste data maybe applying currently cutting edge techniques. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll happily discuss more this topic down here in the comments. So, if you have any question or anything to share and add, please do so. Also, I'd like to thank you very much all the organizing committee that organized this online poster section on protests. It has been a great experience. Thank you very much. And also, I'd like to thank all the members of my lab for all the support. Bye-bye.